Hey there, welcome to the Agentic Voice podcast. My name is Kristen Ruiz. I am here with my co-host, Dr. Geneva Main, and we are delighted to welcome our featured guest today, Judith Wadzak. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about MTD and the confusions and the clarifications and the complexities of functional voice disorders. So Judith, we are so excited to have you here because what you have to bring to the table is going to help a lot of us, especially for those of us in who are working with, with people with MTD and just speaking from personal experience and in conversations with my colleagues, we're seeing more and more of this. So I don't know if the numbers are actually rising, but it feels like it with the the singers and some of the issues that we're seeing come to us. So this is really, really helpful. So for those of you who do not know who Judith Wadzak is, let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a speech language pathologist and vocal health educator, and she's based in Wisconsin. She came to the field of speech language pathology after her own own experience as a singer with a functional voice disorder. She recently completed an MA in professional practice voice pedagogy at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. Her research interests include functional voice disorders, chronic pain, and vocal health education for young vocalists. So Judith, again, thanks so much for being here with us. Yay! <laughs> yes. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is like the first time we're reunited since our talk at PAVA last year. So this yeah. is really cool. Well, let's jump right into our first segment, what's new and what's good. Um, and what's new and what's good, we kind of share, you know, whatever is the latest and greatest about our professional lives, personal lives, whatever we feel comfortable sharing. So today I'm really excited that I finally got the proofs for a paper I've been working on for like two years. And so down to um, the printing stage. So that's exciting. Woohoo! Yes. And I'm super excited that it's finally spring, although it's so um, cloudy in New York today. You know, you're not seeing the sun, but I'm really excited and grateful to have these longer days. And I've been taking advantage of them, bike riding on the weekends. So I'm working for hot girl summer, guys. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So what's up with you, Judith? Yeah, so I'm really excited because I finally finished my second master's degree in voice pedagogy, um, which was a lot of work and I feel like I have so much free time now. Um, so I, I'm just really excited. I finished my final project where I designed an adolescent vocal health curriculum um, and I based it on research in other types of adolescent health curricula like sex ed and substance abuse education, things like that. And so I used all of that information to put together what will hopefully be a really useful and fun curriculum to bring to local young vocalists or even young vocalists not locally so i'm just excited for that i'm also on spring break right now so i can finally i've been like slowly renovating my house um with very bright colors and stuff and so oh lovely. getting into some woodworking projects this week and it's yeah it's fun to give myself a bit of a brain break nice. that's awesome we may require pictures when it's done oh <laughs> <laughs> awesome and what's well, up with you kristen <laughs> yeah, a couple things. Um, uh, it's been a rough couple of weeks de dealing with a couple of health things. Um, had a bad asthma flare up and and it attacked my my lungs and then I had a chronic cough and then I lost my voice. Ooh. And um, I had a, a friend tell me, she goes, you know, when sometimes your body knows more than you do. And when things hit you, really where it counts and you know everybody needs to breathe and speak but I, I definitely recognize that these are my primary tools of trade so when that gets hit you know my friend said you know why don't you stop and ask your your body what is it requiring of you and so i kind of took a breath and made some adjustments. And so what I'm really grateful for is one, really smart friends and, and colleagues, and I'm looking at one, <laughs> Geneva has also been an amazing support in my life. Um, and, and then just energy, because when you, when you choose resourcefulness to get what you need and put things in a different priority, you know, or your change your agenda according to really what needs to be prioritized. It's amazing. So I, I suffered and suffered and finally made some changes and the adjustment back has been actually very quick. So grateful for 
energy and really beautiful people who are smart and speak wisdom into my life. Yay. So grateful for them. So um, are we ready to jump in? I think so. Let's do it. Our next segment is experience, strength, and hope. So let me ask you, Judith, you recently had a paper published on the issues surrounding functional voice disorder classification and MTD. And the title of uh, this episode is the problem with MTD and your paper talked about that. So what I want to ask you is one, what is MTD and what's the problem? Great questions, Kristen. Thank you. So first, I'll just define what MTD is. So it's an acronym. It stands for muscle tension dysphonia. And at least here within the United States, it's one of the it's the most commonly used label for whenever somebody comes into the clinic and they're presenting with voice problems, but they go through the exam and they can't find any structural or neurological cause for that problem, then they typically label it with muscle tension dysphonia or MTD. And so to get into it a little bit more specifically, we can talk about primary MTD, which is like I just said, when there's nothing else that appears to be wrong. Um, so it's kind of its own problem in and of itself. And then there's also secondary MTD, which is when there is a problem. Like for example, let's say somebody has vocal nodules, but in addition to having that problem, like vocal nodules, they appear to have something, They well, they appear to have excess levels of laryngeal tension as a result of that problem. Can I and ask so, you a quick, with the primary MTD, um, what are some of the typical symptoms that, that voice users experience? Yeah, so MTD can have lots of different symptoms, which is kind of part of the problem of it. Generally speaking, like the classic symptoms of MTD are discomfort when vocalizing, restricted range, easily fatiguing voice. So when people are coming to the clinic and they're complaining of those things, but then they can't find a specific cause for everything, okay. that's when they typically get this MTD label. Okay. Are there also like things that we would perceive in terms of the auditory quality of the sound? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, which is also the problem okay. with MTD. Um, so sometimes you might have people coming in and they're speaking with a really breathy voice or a really rough voice, or maybe they have a lot of vocal strain. But sometimes you might have people who are coming in and they're complaining of having vocal fatigue and vocal pain, but their voices sound relatively normal when okay. compared with the rest of the population. So it, it really can vary quite a lot. Got you. So if it's muscle tension dysphonia, does that mean that muscle tension is always the main issue? Uh, ha ha. And that is the problem. So I can kind of get into talking about why I personally don't like the label muscle tension dysphonia. And I don't, I mean, I use it because it's what most people understand, but it pains me a little bit to use it every time. So I'll just kind of talk about some of the problems with this type of vocal condition. Um, so if you look at the research and how people talk about this, you see lots of different labels. So people will use muscle tension dysphonia or MTD. They'll also use words like functional voice disorder, which is actually the label that I've come to prefer. Um, people also use psychogenic voice disorder if they think there's more of a psychological component. They might use muscle misuse dysphonia. There's a new term that has recently been proposed that's called malregulative dysphonia. There's non-organic voice disorder, non-phototraumatic vocal hyperfunction, which is a bit of a mouthful. And this is just really scraping the surface of all of the different labels that are used to describe this type of voice problem. Um, and the issue is that there's a ton of overlap between these labels and it's really not clear where the differences are. It really just has to do with the preferences of different researchers and what their own personal opinions are for what causes this type of voice problem, which is not always clear. And I like this that you quoted, um, you took a quote from Morrison, mm -hmm. 1997, which we'll reference in the episode notes. And it says, any classification that points a finger at one cause tends to ignore or undervalue the other contributing factors. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I love that because the holistic he, systemic, you know, approach, right? Exactly. Right. And so part of the issue with MTD, in my opinion, is that it has muscle tension in the it's right there in the label for this type of problem. And so it kind of it primes you 
to think, aha, muscle tension must be the main issue. And it makes sense that muscle tension would cause some of these problems, but, and this is something that really surprised me when I started researching these conditions more thoroughly, there's actually not great evidence to support that muscle tension is always the main problem. Um, so there's one study that was done in 2021 by Debir Magadam et al. And they were looking at these different laryngeal patterns that are typically associated with muscle tension dysphonia. And they found, and so they had people with an MTD diagnosis and then people without any vocal complaints. And they found that people in both groups had both types of laryngeal patterns. patterns. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes those patterns did occur in higher percentages in the group with MTD. However, that begs the question that if you have people walking around with no vocal complaints and perceptually normal voices with these supposedly problematic laryngeal patterns, is the laryngeal pattern actually what the problem is? Or is there something else potentially at play? Um, so there's that study. There's another study by Sama et al. that found that if you're looking at these laryngeal patterns, it only gives you a 50 to 75% chance of actually correctly diagnosing somebody with MTD and um, figuring out which group that they're in, which just shows that there's a lot of overlap there. And there's also a recent, um, I don't know if they've actually published the results, but last year when Geneva and I were presenting at PAVA, there was a really fascinating study coming out of University of Texas, Dallas um, from Dr. Shemble's lab. And they were talking about how they used ultrasound technology to measure muscle stiffness in people with and without MTD. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but they essentially found that there wasn't a statistically significant difference in muscle stiffness levels in people in these two groups. And so there's just, there's all this mounting evidence that suggests that the muscle tension might actually be a little bit of a red herring. It might kind of not be the main issue for some That people. really violates expectation <laughs> of what you think is going is on. Muscle tension dysphonia, it should be muscle tension. And I think sometimes it is muscle tension. I don't, I'm not saying that it yes. never is muscle tension, but it's not always muscle tension and, um, if you delve into the research more, and I, I can talk about this depending on how much time we have, um, this type of voice problem really, it has like a huge constellation of contributing factors that may or may not occur. And so every single person that gets this diagnosis is going to have different components and different amounts. And they may all present kind of similarly, but they're like background factors that lead to their voice problem all may be very, very different. And so it really does them a disservice to come at this as with a, it, this is a muscle tension. Now, do um, they have a sense if, it, if hyperfunctionality, you know, is not part of the issue um, for, for a percentage of people dealing with this, do they have a sense of what else it might be or that is the mystery? That, that is the mystery. And I think that, that there's going to be a lot of really interesting research coming out in the coming years um, looking at that. My personal guess is that for some of these people, it might be a chronic pain, like neurological pathway that's been activated. Um, I know that that um, study that I referenced from um, the larynx lab at University of Texas, Dallas, they were guessing that there might be some kind of a like a difference in the somatosensory um, uh, somatosensory system within the body. And so that could be it too. It could be that there are just really, really subtle muscle tension differences that aren't picked up with the equipment that we currently have access to. Um, and it could just be that every single person has different things that cause it. Because if you look at it, there really are, there's different factors that can occur to lead to this type of clinical presentation. Yeah, I know we don't have a lot of time, but just a quick, you, you mentioned the contributing factors. Can you just share some of those? Absolutely. So um, in my paper that I published, um, that, that in my paper that was recently published, I like to think about um, the different factors for functional voice disorders as like a rainbow color wheel. And I actually have that as some case studies in the paper that I wrote. Um, the color wheel is something that's been used by the autistic community for a long time to talk about how autism is a spectrum and it's not just a like 
spectrum from not autistic to very autistic. It's like a whole constellation of different things that can all contribute to one's experience of autism. So um, when I'm thinking about functional voice disorders, it's a similar thing where you can have these different factors. So sometimes there might be a neurological factor happening, such as a highly activated pain system. There could be higher levels of autonomic nervous system activation, so like fight or flight type symptoms. There's psychological factors that show up in the literature a lot, so elevated levels of emotional reactivity or being more introverted or just really having a strong physical response to different psychological factors mm -hmm. that can be part of it. There's behavioral factors, which has to do with one's vocal habits. So if you have somebody who just, they're speaking in a way that there's just a lot of extra strain in how they talk, that can be a contributing factor, but not always. You have people that will speak in a perfectly perceptually normal way and they still have difficulty. There's those musculoskeletal factors we've talked about. So muscle tension, posture, things like that. There could be structural factors if there's a secondary, if this is secondary to lesions or nodules. So those could be in the background as well. I'm not done with the factors yet. There's even more. It could be aerodynamic factors, so like excess subglottal pressure. But again, some people will have excess subglottal pressure. Some people will have pretty normal aerodynamic measures. Um, could be acoustic factors, which is how the voice is sounding. But again, you have people who Focus sound pretty perfectly normal mm -hmm. and they're still experiencing vocal problems. Um, could be environmental factors. And so when I'm talking about that, I'm thinking about things like reflux or different irritants in the environment. Um, or it could just be like the demands, like emotional demands of the environment that can also have an impact. And so you have all of these different factors and you could have two people that present very similarly but if you delve into the background of what's happening one person they might have like really really high psychological components of it like they're under a whole lot of stress they really physically manifest how they're feeling and that's a huge contributing factor for their voice problems and then you could have another person that has very, very few psychological contributing factors, but they have just a ton of extrinsic muscular tension because of the way that they're using their voice. And so this is why I think having a, a label like muscle tension dysphonia is just oversimplifies what is a really heterogeneous group of people. Yes. Yeah. And I really like that you like the term functional voice disorder because I prefer that too, and I think that's pretty consistent with um, the consensus of where our field is headed mm -hmm. um, and using the term functional neurological disorder so that we're moving away from diagnosis of exclusion and looking for positive signs. Um, you mentioned that, uh, that Baker et al. consensus mm -hmm. paper in your paper. And, and they're just, I'm just going to throw out some of the positive signs that if anyone's wondering if they have this, you know, because that's what we do. <laughs> you can Google <laughs> or know what that term is, functional neurological disorder. Um, but always, you know, if you have concerns about your voice and, and they're lasting for more than two weeks, go see an ENT. Mm -hmm. Positive signs would be sim your symptoms are inconsistent with clinical examination. So like those acoustic measures and aerodynamic measures and the visual imaging um, that they do uh, when they scope you. So if, if the voice quality or the, the speech deficit is more severe or is disproportionately severe compared to, you know, those clinical findings, they might say, hmm, what is going on here? Um, they also, another positive sign would be symptoms are internally inconsistent. When you say or, internally inconsistent, what does that mean? So your symptoms might become worse if you pay more attention to it or if you're talking about it. <laughs> gotcha. And then if your symptoms are associated with inefficient or non-ergonomic patterns of movement, struggling behaviors over mounting, eye blinking, facial contortions, excessive effort in breathing, neck, shoulder strap muscles, shifts in body posture, um, including in during non-speech or remote tasks, these are all positive signs. So I like that they're moving away from a diagnosis of exclusion because when you have a diagnosis of exclusion, people are like, well, you don't really know what I have. 
Well, it kind of feels like a junk drawer. Right. Like I have a drawer for things that I don't know where else to put them. Right. But it's not a really organized, it's not an efficient drawer. Right. But when you're looking for these positive signs, then it's like, okay, this makes sense. Right. Um, so, yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, Judith, mm -hmm. um, how did you get into this work? I know, you know, when we worked together last summer at Pava, you talked about your own uh, experience with a functional voice disorder. Will you share a little bit about that in your journey into this kind of work? Yeah, I would love to. So, I mean, a lot of the reason I do research is because I'm a huge nerd, but also a lot of the reason is because it's, it's deeply personal to me. Um, I grew up singing and doing lots of honors choirs. I started doing musical theater when I was eight years old and was in basically at least one musical a year every single year after that. And so performing and singing was just a huge part of my life and a huge part of my identity for as long as I can remember. And so when I went to college, I decided that I wanted to major in music and focus on vocal performance. So I was mostly focusing on Western classical music, but also doing a little bit of musical theater and a little bit of jazz voice thrown in there. But my junior year of college, I had a summer where I was I was singing in the chorus of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat as a soprano, which is it's a wonderful, wonderful show. But if you're at all familiar with the chorus part of that or the soprano part of that, it's very vocally demanding and you're just like belting out high B flats for two hours. Um, so I was in a community theater production of that summer before my junior year and doing a lot of other vocalizing as well and not dealing with colds and allergies as proactively as I now know I should have. I was young and thought I was invincible. Um, and so partway through the performances, I just was dealing with tons of vocal fatigue, tons of vocal pain. And so I eventually, you know, I, I went on voice rest after the performances were done and my voice sort of came back, but then I started fall of my junior year of college and things just weren't feeling right in voice lessons and in choir rehearsals i was fatiguing very quickly feeling a lot of vocal pain um having difficulty accessing parts of my range and so i went in and i saw a laryngologist and i was diagnosed with mtd um which as you can imagine was a very heartbreaking traumatic identity shifting experience um so i got that diagnosis and then what followed was years of working with really really highly qualified amazing voice professionals who are using all of the tricks in the book and they would they helped me a certain amount i think i did have some muscle tension at play and they definitely helped me manage that better and i i got a little bit better but i never fully cure, was able to cure my voice, which is what led me to getting a master's degree in speech pathology and doing research on this voice disorder because it's it's just a big mystery in my own life why after you know all the hard work I've done and all the really wonderful people I've worked with, why it is that I can you know almost get to a way like get to a place where my voice is doing what I'd like it to do. And then I fall back into what I like to call the MTD pit, and I'm in a lot of pain yet again when speaking and singing. Um, and also part of it was that initially, like when I was having difficulty in spite of doing normal voice therapy, most of my voice therapists were just, they didn't know what to tell me. They were confused. They were kind of shocked. They would go like, I don't know, see a massage therapist and, you know, I'd see a massage therapist and that would kind of help, but it wouldn't solve all of my problems. And so I thought, geez, like, what's wrong with me? Am I the only person that this is an issue for? But now with, you know, wider access to social media spaces, I've learned that really it's not uncommon for people with this type of voice problem to still have difficulty even after going through a normal course of voice therapy. And so... That's and I just want to pause and amplify that, that you can show gains after your course of voice therapy and then, you know, still be dealing with it. 
a year out. So that's why it's important to have a full team around you, not just mm -hmm. a laryngologist and a speech pathologist, but perhaps a vocologist, a voice teacher who is really knowledgeable about aerodynamics and pressures and mm -hmm. um, things like that in your voice. So that's part of the ongoing care for you, especially if you are someone who um, maybe your your voice disorder, your muscle tension dysphonia had psychological factors as a contributing factor or stressors in your life as a contributing factor or has ongoing stressors in your life, that's really, really important. So if anyone is like dealing with that and having those same kinds of thoughts that Judith had, you are not alone, right? Not yeah. alone. And look for like, yeah, singing by specialist who understands the holistic systematic approach to, to voice development that aerodynamics are part of the story um valving you know that's what i call the vocal vocal like the valving is part of the story the the vocal track shaping or the acoustics are part of the story and the the social emotional and psycho um aspects uh, of the story are all woven together into an approach so you need somebody who can see it holistically yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not just doing what their voice teacher did, so they're going to do that with you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You need really smart people to be able to think about things creatively yes. a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, this whole experience, it just it led me to wanting to do my own research into chronic voice disorders and um, trying to figure out where I think some of the gaps are in what we know about this type of vocal condition mm -hmm. um, so we can hopefully have better treatment outcomes for people and also um, research on how we can educate young vocalists to make better decisions so they can navigate healthy vocalizing throughout their whole lives hopefully a little bit more effectively mm -hmm. nice absolutely i think one of the things geneva and i have talked about um, is the stigma around mtd and even within the literature and this is where i'm going to kind of turn it over to geneva <laughs> but there are some labels sometimes associated in the the research that uh well i would like to hear more about because there's a little part there's a little a little heckler muppet on my shoulder saying i don't know if i believe that so uh you geneva i'm going to pass this over because i know you know what i'm talking about <laughs> she knows exactly what it is judith <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we both, I mean, yeah, you know, Judith and I both, you know, have a similar story with getting, you know, MTD. And when you look in the research and you say, yeah, if you're introverted and neurotic, <laughs> neurotic, you are more likely to have this disorder. You're like, I'm neurotic. <laughs> It just seems so offensive. I'm not going to lie. It sounds right. like here you are dealing with your voice and now you've got the literature saying, well, you must be introverted and neurotic. Right. Now, as, as an introvert, I'm, I'm okay with being labeled that. Um, you know. yeah. But neurotic. But neurotic. So really, I mean, that gave me pause too when I first read it. And especially yeah. when you read some of the like earlier literature on it, it gets into some interesting psychoanalysis that especially, I, I don't know. It, I felt like they were they were talking about it like it was a personality disorder. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so there's a couple yeah. things to talk about there. So first yeah. we could just talk about the the label neurotic. But basically, like within the psychology literature, when they say neurotic, it's not what we usually mean when we say neurotic. When we okay. say neurotic, we usually mean somebody who's like not completely there and they're like very uptight and like they're like fussy about everything right what they actually mean when they say neurotic is they mean highly emotionally reactive um and so it has to do with emotional reactivity to one's environment and this can be like outwards emotional reactivity like something happens and you immediately need to talk about it and vent about it and let those emotions out so it can be like external emotional yeah. reactivity or it can be internal emotional reactivity where like something happens in your environment that is emotionally charged and you really close in on yourself and you really take those emotions on internally in a way that's maybe more potent i guess than the it would be for the general population yeah um, so like internalizing or externalizing so the only thing that i want to comment about that is that you know and i, I don't know the psychology literature that that well and mm -hmm. how terms are used but 
you know, what we do know from counseling professions and and um, their research is that you can manage your emotional reactivity. Mm -hmm. So is it really a personality trait? Like if you're someone who um, you, you kind of go through life and you're not doing the self-reflection and you're not doing the gratitude and you're not, you know, um, getting um, regular exercise and things like that, you tend to be more emotionally reactive. Mm. But what we know is you can manage those emotions when you're doing all of those things. So I wonder how much of it is a trait or lifestyle things. Right. I don't know. It's all very confusing. To it me. All, I, it find is, it, yeah. I find <laughs> it confusing because it also like, like, so, okay, if we're repressed and shut down, we don't have to worry about MTV then, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I feel like there's more unpacking of this that needs to happen. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, Okay, there's a couple of things that I wanted to say in response. What am I? <laughs> yeah, this is a great discussion. So with the reactivity thing and the shutting down, um, mm -hmm. you actually, if you get into the literature, looking at the psychological factors for this type of vocal condition, um, they talk about how for some people there's a fear of speaking out. Mm -hmm. And so like something happens, they emotionally react and shut it, shut down. And so you might think like, oh, they're not talking, therefore there's not... Um, like a vocal response happening, therefore it's less likely that there would be negative vocal symptoms. However, that's when um, feeling laryngeal tension or feeling laryngeal discomfort can happen because there's kind of like a clamping down saying, I'm not gonna speak out in this situation. I'm going to silence myself for whatever reason. Um, and so that's when this emotional reactivity the literature says can lead into having some type of a vocal problem. Right. But again, I mean, not for nothing, for some people, not speaking out could be a survival strategy that you Ooh, learn. It, it makes total sense a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like if I speak out or say something, maybe I'm no longer safe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm not going to say anything. Um, so again, is that a personality trait or is that your lived experience. Or is that somebody's environment? And right. that's, why, that's why it's so important to think about these things as multifaceted conditions. Yes. yes. Because it could be some, somebody that it appears that it's a personality trait, but really the bigger deal is that they're dealing with a ton of environmental stress in their lives. And they're just reacting as any human would in these types of conditions. And it's it makes perfect sense why they're reacting that way. Um, and so if you're not looking at those environmental factors, you might be missing the biggest part of the picture. Yeah. For, for treatment and that kind of thing, um, is it a positive, are we seeing positive results moving forward for the wider population who's dealing with this? I don't know. I think that this is something where we need more research and we also just need more education on how these conditions are so multifaceted. Um, we have this big issue within speech pathology where we do have some places that have really, really wonderful um, multidisciplinary voice clinics where they do pull in people from lots of different areas who have really great training and are really able to look at all the nitty gritty aspects of this type of thing. But if you think about just like generally the resources that people have available to them, it's more likely that they're going to be seeing a medically based speech pathologist who is, I'm sure, very, very well trained in a lot of aspects of their job, but might only have one voice disorders class from undergrad where they had one lecture on MTD that just said it was a muscle tension based issue. And they've maybe done one resonant voice therapy class and those are all great tools and a great starting point but then they you know they might be primed by hearing this muscle tension label and so they're just really going to say your voice is tense your voice is tense your voice is tense you need to relax and not necessarily get into all of these other factors and so then you might not have good treatment outcomes um so I'm hopeful that things will get better as there's more education and more podcasts like this getting the word out there. But it, I think it's 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 a paradigm shift that's a long time coming and we're still in the midst of. Well, thank you so much for sharing your lived experience in navigating a voice disorder and um, your experience within within the profession. So for our last segment, 
we like to highlight an agentic practice since, you know, Kristen brought up treatment. Um, for our agentic practice, we're thinking about things that help to free and empower voices or people. Um, so what's your favorite agentic practice? Yeah, so just speaking as a vocalist who experiences vocal difficulty and has for a long time and has kind of been through all the ups and downs of navigating this, one of the huge light bulb moments for me, and this happened, I don't know, it was several years into experiencing my voice disorder, was that my voice didn't have to be perfect for me to still use it and use it publicly. Um, I spent so many years thinking, okay, I have to have a voice completely free from tension. I have to have a voice completely free from pain. I have to have a voice that I can use for a long time without getting fatigued, or I'm not going to use my voice at all. Um, and then I eventually got to the point where I just went, you know what? I hope that someday I can figure out the magic secret sauce to get rid of all my voice problems, but that day might never come. I might always have a little bit of vocal fatigue. I might always have a little bit of pain when I sing, but I'm still going to sing and I'm still going to share my singing with others. And so I think just this idea that singing and vocalizing in and of itself are their worthwhile pursuits, even if there's other aspects of it that make it complicated and make it less than perfect that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use your voice you still should use your voice and there still are ways for you to use your voice you just might have to approach it a little bit differently than people who don't have your vocal difficulties that's amazing and i wholeheartedly believe that because no voice should be silenced not every voice um is like performing at the same level you know mm -hmm but no voice should be silenced. And, and I think that aligns very well with uh, our SAMHSA key principles, empowerment, voice, and choice. Every voice should be empowered to speak its authentic truth. What you have to say, you're, what, um, in our studio, we call it, the, you have a vocal soul. You have a vocal soul that has a right to be expressed. And then the singing voice is just the vehicle for getting the internal external. So the value is about you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then and then the reason that we work on the voice is so the freer it gets and the easier it gets, the the smoother that expression, you know, that express expressivity comes out. So yeah. Um, so, yeah, the value is you and that right. doesn't change, even if there's some challenges. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and for anybody dealing with MTD, I really do recommend please continue to seek out people who know what they're doing, who have experience with this. Um, because we, I do know many singers with, who have the diagnosis of MTD and they're doing amazing things, you know, amazing, sometimes unimaginable a year later compared to, to where they started. So please keep, keep looking for people who know what they're doing. Awesome. Um, so in this episode, we discussed muscle tension dysphonia as a functional voice disorder. We also discussed accepting and empowering our voice as a tool for creating vocal agency. And we just want to thank you so much, Judith, for sharing your lived experience as a patient, as a clinician, as a researcher, um, and for sharing that story because lived experiences are healing for people who are listening and going through the same thing. We're so grateful to have you.